In Chicago, you know that all sports rock. The Bears, Hawks, Bulls, Cubs, and Sox. Pick your favorite, you can choose. As long as the Packers lose. For everything you need to know, it's Bill Swarski Sports Talk Chicago. Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Bills for Ski Sports Talk Chicago. This is your hosts, Alex and Sean. On this episode, we're going to be talking about more bad baseball from both sides of town. Uh, we're talking the Bears getting ever so close to starting training camp, a little foot or a basketball, a little hockey. But first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Rockford Ice Hogs. If you're not familiar with the Rockford Ice Hogs, they're the AHL minor league affiliate of the Chicago Blackhawks. What does that mean for you? You could see the stars of tomorrow today at family-friendly affordable places. So Father's Day is coming up, and so is graduations. So make sure you head on over to icehawks.com. Get hat, shirt, jersey, tickets, and more for those dads and grads in your life. Tell them Swirsky Sports sent you. Oh, Alex. You know, this week, the Cubs had a winning record. Won three, lost two, but it sure didn't feel good. No, not even close. Not even close. I have never felt so bad about having a winning week of baseball as I have in this week, probably ever. No, I mean, you just lost three before the rest. The NS Central continues to own you. And... You are so, 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 so lucky that the White Sox are what they are because you should have lost both those games. You were down, what, 5 nothing in the first game, then a rain delay came, and the second game you were down 5-1. to one. Now, yes, you did a few things to claw back, but the Sox did you some solids. I mean, you, you should not have struggled that mightily to beat the White Sox. And, and listen, I get the White Sox in... Milwaukee had leads in all those games too. And then they lost it late, but Milwaukee, even in the first game was trailing into the seventh inning and they ended up winning that game like 12 to five. They put up like like 20 play on you. Um, You needed a lot of stupid white Sox plays, whether it's Paul DeYoung taking his time going to second base or some box by Michael Soroka to get you back into those games. You got the wins. You needed them. But they weren't clean. They were not clean. And then here you are in Cincinnati. You can't get a clutch hit to save your life. Even in today's game, they were up 4 nothing early. You had the chance to put the dagger in before even the third inning. And you continually let scoring chances squander. I think you you squandered 12. You left 12 guys on base. I, you left 12 guys on base today. You kept the Reds in the ball game. Yes, you won. Yes, you needed it. It was great to see Shota Imanaga pitch well again, but it, it, that should have been a blowout. You haven't won a game three plus ones in regulation since the Leaves. That was almost a month ago. The only other time you won a game by three plus runs was that extra inning game in Milwaukee. That's it. You're not blowing anybody out. And also, you've lost so many frustrating games. And also, when was the last time you won two series in a row? Oh God. I couldn't I couldn't even tell you. That's sad. You have a really good memory. That's sad. I know. I know that's sad. Let me think. They they won in Pittsburgh two or three. Was that the last time? You lost. Us both see the Braves. It's been a while. It has been a while. I let me let me look at this schedule here. I don't know the answer to this. So you lost to the Reds. You won the beat the White Sox, but then you lost to the Reds again. Um. Let's see. So you won two or three in Pittsburgh. The, I'm trying to think what the series before this. Okay. You, you lost. You, you lost split both. against the Mets. You split against the 
bets. You lost both in St. Louis. You lost three or four at Milwaukee. You won two or three against Milwaukee at home, but that was like the first week of May. Uh, let's see. That was over a month ago. Yeah, you didn't win there. You lost there. You lost there. You lost there. <laughs> Lots of L's. Lots of L's. Um, are you? All right, it was. You beat the. The. Oh wait, no, that's that had to be. So wait, wait, no. <laughs> um. The fact that we have to go this in depth was, of, to re recall this. Was it the Mets and the Red Sox? You, the end of April? Well, you split. You, and you lost the, that Red Sox series. Uh, uh, yeah, let's see. Oh, yeah, you're right. Damn it. They, they uh, lost two of the. Um. Was it the Diamondbacks and the, the Mariners in late April? You won two it, with it, in mid April. Yes. It was the Diamondbacks and the Mariners. Wow. wow. That will be Wow. So that will be it you it'll be over two months before you have won back to back series. That's insane. Insane. How many games have we lost because we can't get the big hit? I mean, How... it's can't get the yes, big hit, can't get the big out. Where the fuck is Patrick Wisdom leading off? What were we doing with that? Yeah, there's no way because they, they lost the series to the Reds. There's no way for them to win two series in a row in and make it be less than two months because the earliest they could do it is next Saturday. Did you see how tight the NL race is? And we're in the thick of it, but have you seen it? You've seen how tight and pretty mediocre it is, right? Oh, absolutely. The Cubs have a, the Cubs are in the wild card. I mean, they, they have the last wild card. And here's something to keep in mind against your division. You don't have the tiebreakers right now. Yep. You don't have it against the Pirates. You don't have it against the Reds. You don't have it against the Cubs. You don't have it against the Brewers. I mean, the Brewers are winning the division by quite a lot right now. Um, but you don't have the tiebreaker against any. You don't have the tiebreaker against the Padres. You don't have the tiebreaker against like any of these fucking teams. Yeah. So the Phillies have a stranglehold on their division. The Dodgers That's have a, a team. Yeah, uh, the I mean, you know what? On paper, they uh, they shouldn't be that good. They're just they just all play well as a team. The Dodgers have a pretty good lead in their division. Milwaukee's got a good lead in their division. Atlanta, uh, Atlanta and San Diego. Atlanta has a, a good lock on the the wild card lead, but. Dodgers, Cubs, Cincinnati, San Francisco, St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Arizona, Washington, and the Mets. Like, do you have a few games separate all of those teams in the wild card race? It's ridiculous. Think about this. I was thinking about this after today's win. I, I, I was more relieved after today's win. I wasn't exact this didn't move me today's win. the only thing that i could take away from today's win is shota imanaga really rebounded after two bad starts and that was great to see but otherwise all this, you know the 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 issues with the hitting and the scoring it's just it's still there but um if you look at the situation if you go back to all these series that you played against these nl central opponents so go back to the three or that you lost at home against the and and all the series following that. So the Pirates at home, the Cardinals on the road, Milwaukee in the road, Cincinnati at home, Cincinnati on the road. All those series right there. If you win one game, just, just one more game in each of those series, you know what that means? 
you would have tied against the Reds. You would have tied against the Brewers. You would have tied against the Cardinals. You would have won two or three at home against the Reds. You would have split against the Pirates at home. If you do that, you literally just win one more game in each of those series. You could be in so much better shape right now. And so many of those losses is because of all the stupid shit that we've said. Fake rallies. Not getting the big hit. Something bad base path. Something bad defensively. Something going wrong in the bullpen. Give the bullpen credit today. It was really, really good coming in for Imanaga. But this come throughout. Just think. Just, just a few swings. You're a few swings away from having good control in this race. But you can't consistently... Get- you had the tying run on third with one out yesterday, and you couldn't get him in. This team's consistent failure to move up runners and even generate runs is maddening. And it's uh, how, unless you're hitting the ball at the ballpark and everything's clicking, how are you going to fix it? How are you going to fix it? I can tell you one thing you can't have Patrick Wisdom batting leadoff anymore. No. Fuck that shit. What the fuck was that? I, you know, I understand having Patrick Wisdom in the lineup. Because he he is a threat to hit the ball out of the park, and you just lack power. You just lack power. I, I get I get that the desire to put him in the lineup, but put him appropriately. Put him in somewhere smarter, better. Like what the hell? And I'm yeah. going to read you a, a, some stats here oh that you're here not going to like. <laughs> right, of course. So, so going into right. Saturday, the Cubs are seven and fourteen versus the division. But they're seven and two versus Colorado, Miami, and the White Sox. 24 and 31 against everybody else. They're nine and two in games that Shota starts. When Shota doesn't start, they're 22 and 31. That's wow. That's eye opening. That is really eye opening. It they're they're not a good baseball team. And they, they, I mean, they, uh, they have, and you know, I knew going into the season that they were not going to be a World Series threat, and I think we both acknowledge that, right? But, yes, but they should be a whole lot better than they are. I mean, and, and the frustrating thing is when one thing works, another thing doesn't. How many times have we seen the starting pitching go out and ball out, and then and they can't then? And then the starting pitching will have some leaks when they actually decide to score some runs or the bullpen will fall apart. But what gets me more than anything, over anything, because, you know, you go in slumps offensively, that happens. You can't rely on Shota having, you know, a a sub one ERA. It's just not possible. And even with Javier Assad, Javier Saad, yeah, is shown a little bit of regression, but it, to his credit, he's still able to keep you in a game. But among all that, what is with the, the lack of fundamental? How many times do we make stupid outs on the base pass? How many times do we flub a routine play? And I, I don't, I don't like oh always going at individuals, but you can't tell me that Christopher Morrell at third isn't a problem. We've seen way too many, whether it's a flat out or whether it's just, you know, hit like cutting off a ball when you had a play at the plate, it's little things like that. And, you know, he's, he's gotten better at the routine plays, making the throws, but you still get those. I mean, remember that arrogant White Sox? Yeah. Bad. And I'm a big Seiya Suzuki guy, and I love his bat. And he was 3 5 today after getting hurt. But I, I just, I really wish he would DH more. I think he'd be a great DH. Yeah, I, I just, I mean, both, the fielding just doesn't look good. Both from a. In- his fielding perspective and preservation of his body. Yes. I I'm all for it. Absolutely. And if you move him, there is 
you could put Morrell in a corner outfield spot. And he's less of a detriment out there than he is playing third. And, you know, think about this, too. Here's something that I think you can... I think this would be a reasonable lineup, in my opinion. If if you still keep Morrell at third, here's another reasonable lineup I think you could put out defensively. And let me get your thoughts on this. Okay. Bellinger at first. Mm-hmm. Talkman in right. Okay. Right. CA in center. Happ in left. That's probably your best defense up you can get. Yeah. I'm with you on that. And I think when you look at the situation too, is as much of a problem Morrell can be at third base. Your only other option right now is David Bodie. And if there is a situation where you want to DH Morrell and play Bodie at third. Okay. Then, then you'll have say out. In right field. I mean, even today, Talkman played right field. So we've seen that ideal lineup just today, that that ideal offensive lineup. Um, but if you want Saya in the lineup, you can't DH both Saya and Morrell. The other thing that I want to express some concern about is j- just flat out asking, is Morrell really an everyday player? I want to say yes, but you've got to earn it. And if, if you can't earn it by your play on uh, as a defensive position player to make up for lack of productivity with your bat, then you better be really productive with your bat at bats as a DH. And, you know, at some point you're like, well, he hits the ball hard. Just no baseball luck. Um, it's a results driven league. And if the results aren't there, then you shouldn't be playing every day. Well, right. Exactly. You can make the, uh, the luck excuse only for so long. And I, I think that Morel has obviously improved greatly in terms of discipline, you know, he's drawing more walks, he's laying off certain pitches he can, but you know, it's, it's like Morrell has a a run score situation. He either excels or he looks really, really bad. And, you know, again, I'm not saying get rid of the guy, but um, you know, today he was hitting in multiple big spots and didn't come through. And we've seen that in a number of times. And it just, and not everyone's going to come through a hundred percent of the time, but you know, again, you're hitting around 200 after a while. You, the the, the score cards got to reflect better. He's, he's got a 388 slugging 315 OBP and he left five runners on base today. Yeah. And 315 OBP is around average. What would you say? 388. Slugging? 388. Yeah, that that's got to be better. Yeah. For a power hitter like him, that's that's just got to be better. So, I'm going to pose a question and yes. I don't know the answer to this. Is uh last year between his stint in the majors and in the minors, Michael Bush was a third baseman. How bad is he as a third baseman that we're not playing him at third base? Pretty bad. That's my, I, I, I know that his defense was less than to be desired, but, uh, didn't Bush play second today? He played second today. Yeah. I, I, I just, I think it speaks volumes that they haven't even tried with that experiment. I, I think so. I mean, I, so Bush, I know started his career as a second baseman and they, uh, the Dodgers moved him to first in the to left field. And then uh, last year, he he mostly played third base between AAA and, and the Dodgers. So I, I don't, I don't know how bad he is as a third baseman, but the fact that they haven't tried that as an option makes me 
makes me uh go scratch my head a little bit. I mean, they they seem very hell bent on Morel at third, and you know, and I'm not saying I want to move off the position permanently or off the team permanently, but my whole point with Morel is you just you, you want to see more consistency. Hopefully that'll come, but you want to just see more consistency. And um hopefully that hard hit rate will turn into more hits eventually, but like you said, it's a result-based business and over a certain sample of time, you got to say listen, it, it's got to reflect score card and I just don't know if batting him fourth is the best idea. Unfortunately, you don't really have a four that you're confident putting in there. No, no, you don't. Um, and it's, uh, it's sad. You just, you really, you really lack power. Um, and you're like, oh, well, Ballinger is your big money guy, but he he has potential to have hit for power but it's he's not like a home run hitter he's not a 40 home run guy um not in this stage in his career wisdom wisdom probably has your best power potential but he's too he's, many holes so many holes like he's batting 200 with a 278 obp so many holes um and uh, Suzuki is just not having that power stroke that I think we had hoped for when we signed him. And so I, I don't know. I, I don't know what else you do. Yeah. I mean, it's like, if you look at Bellinger's numbers, they're fine. They're, they're, they're not bad. They're fine. But, you know, you don't look like many of the cleanup hitters, the top dogs, which a point I've made, you know, they don't look like the band, all your Robins. Uh, you don't have a Bryce Harper or a Juan Soto or Bullis Garcia or a Giancarlo Stanton. I mean, that right there is an example. Like Giancarlo Stanton has the easiest power stroke that I think I've ever seen and many living people have ever seen. And you really don't have anything close to that. I mean, like, sure. Can Dansby Swanson hit 20 homers? Yes. Can say Suzuki hit 20 homers? Yes. Can Cody Bellinger hit 25? Yes. Can Ian Happ hit 20? Yes. But that's, that's kind of ceiling right there. You don't have a guy who are like, Oh, 35, 40. Absolutely. I mean, nothing close to that. And frankly, I don't think it helps either that, that I think Manfred is dead in the balls again. So that makes it even harder. Yeah. And the, the easy solution is you go, will you trade for Pete Alonzo? But the issue is that if you try to trade for Pete Alonzo right now, the Mets may tell you no, number one. And number two, right. if they do say yes, you're going to pay through the nose to get him two months early or a month and a half early. And, and who, if you wait until the trade deadline, you might be out of it. And the Mets might be right back in it. I mean, the Mets are, the Mets are like three games out of the wild card. It's not, it's not like they're that far out. They just play in a tough no, division. No, that's the thing. Because if you're looking at making a trade for your, you know, to impact your team, the types of trades you'd probably be looking more at is like an Elias Diaz from the Rockies. Cause everybody and their mother knows the Rockies are going nowhere. Whereas most other NL teams are at least within it. But the problem with him is, is you are going to pay for him. I'm And uh, is you got to ask yourself, here's the predicament that the Cubs are in. You look at your lineup and you look at what you're doing, and are you putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole? Is Are you going to trade away from your farm system heavily to get a guy that 
might be worth it, but is not going to help this flawed team. You need a bullpen arm. You need a power bat. You need a catcher. You need a leadoff hitter. Like there's, there's holes in this lineup and you're not going to trade for them all. And you know, this, I don't think this is ever meant to be a world series contending team. So what, you know, what do you, what do you do? Do you just stand pat and play the cards as they are? Do you make some minor, uh, you know, try to trade those guys that you're not going to be able to keep on your 40 man and you might lose. Like, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah. Now I, I think that you make all good points and it kind of depends on what position you're looking at because the Cubs did go out and get a reliever and he's been pretty solid. You didn't really have to pay much for that. I think you can do the same thing for a veteran catcher. You can acquire one without necessarily breaking the bank. Now, getting a superstar, that's a little different, or at least a, a all-star impact middle of the line of player. But I, I mean, I just, I really think that you have to address the catcher issue. I'm going to give Amaya something. I think he's been playing better recently. Um, but I just, Jan Gomes, the, the tank just is empty. I mean, he is just a shell of his former self. He hasn't been able to hit. He hasn't been able to defend. You know, he can't throw anybody out. That's just, you need a veteran catcher. And it's really tough when a veteran catcher can't even do the stuff that a veteran catcher like him was once able to do. It's thing to decline in offense, but if you're not giving any defensive value, then you're really not just giving anything. Yeah. So right now, if you're looking at teams that are out of it as, as options that are, you know what, they're probably, you know, in getting ready for sell mode is you're looking at Oakland. You're looking at, uh, the angels, the, White Sox. the, the angels, the white Sox. Colorado and Miami. Yep. That's it. Everybody else is either right in the thick of things or the one kind of outlier is Houston, but I think they have enough cachet and, and veteran leadership and that they could easily get right back into that. I Um, have difficulty seeing the Astros just waving the white flag at this point. And same with Texas, Texas is, you know, not playing the that defending well. champs. Yeah, they're gonna be right back into it. Um Toronto is right in it, but they are like in that division. It is like you've got You're kind of juggern- screwed. You're kind of screwed in that position. Yeah, you're you've got juggernauts there. You know, the Yankees and the Orioles are arguably two of the best three baseball teams in or three teams in baseball. And um that's in the American League, that's for sure. Yeah. And so, you know, I know Cleveland has the same record, or maybe just slightly better record than Baltimore, but they also have the the benefit of playing an incredibly terrible division. Um where Baltimore's playing a really tough division. So, you know, you got to give them that benefit, but they're two really good baseball teams. And I expect one of those two to represent the American league in, in the world series. So it's, uh, um, you know, there's, there's not that many, I mean, so what I was saying is Toronto, maybe they're, they'll consider, you know, uh, reconsider how they've built this team not that they're out of it but based on who they're going to have to pay soon and if they don't feel like this core is going to be the core that gets them to beat the yankees and the orioles who orioles are incredibly young and and still have a lot of players that they can bring up so you know you've really got to bring this home if you're toronto or regroup later down the road. So there's, there's just not that many teams that are, are, are willing to trade at this point. And, you know, the, you look at the white Sox. All right, you need a catcher. They're not going to trade you Corey Lee. And you don't want Martin Maldonado because he is oh, worse. He's God. worse than what you have. Oh my Lord. So that, 
that, that's a condition we'll have in a little bit. Oh yeah, we will have that from two fronts. <laughs> the yeah. so, I, so that that's you know it's it's just it's just a bad situation, and um, I don't know what this team will look like as we get closer to the trade deadline. Yeah. I mean, it it just, it feels like the Cubs just want to keep waiting this out because they have this farm system, but eventually one one way or another, it's the farm assets coming up themselves, or it's using some of those farm assets to acquire better talent. You're, you know, it's going to have to prove its value. Um, And I think that some fans can look at the situation and say, Hey, you got Canaro hitting homes you got brennan davis hitting home runs uh can we borrow some of that power for a little bit um you sent magical down to bring up david Bodie out of desperate he's not a prospect far from just saying you had to reach down and get something um so yeah i mean there's there's a lot of questions going forward and what's frustrating is you see a lot of what was really hurting you over the past month seemingly kind of peek through in a good way. Like Ian Happ's been hitting again. Dansby Swanson over the past week has been hitting again. You've seen Shota Aga rebound today. You've seen your bullpen overall pitch fairly well. Um, you know, some games weren't great, but uh, you know, today it was really good. The bullpen kept you in it yesterday and through most of the series and you just couldn't get the big hit. You've seen Miguel Amaya swing a little bit better, but like it just, it still just seemed to materialize. There's always, there's always some sort of obstacle, whether it's Christopher Morrell having a bad day or Nico Horner getting hit and hurt or having a bad start from like Tyone or seeing Hayden Wesneski give up a couple of bombs it's like there's something getting in the way of what you're trying to fully accomplish here. And it's like, if you can iron out a few of these things, you'd have a few more wins right now because it seems like throughout this entire season, nothing has functioned altogether. The facets of the game, just when one thing goes right, another thing doesn't. And that's the problem with this roster is constructed. You don't have superstars that can help pick guys up. You don't have that big range of skill set where you have a guy that just hit tanked and right, or you have a guy that just sprays line drives and hits 320 plus. It's like everything is kind of in between. You don't really have a full identity. You're not exactly a contact scrappy team, but you're not a power hitting one either. It's like you're all just kind of stuck in the middle with this questionable identity where you're like, what exactly are you? And you, like I said, in like you said before on this show, you have a bunch of Robins, but no Batman. The The frustrating part is at the end of the year, $50 says that they fire their hitting coach. And For every, ten, every year, time. yeah, every year they fire their hitting coach. It, it, at what point does it start being the players? Does it start being the GM that put these players together? You know, it, right. it's, it has to be like, all right, organizational philosophy of hitting. You know, if you're changing your launch angle to try to hit more home runs, but you're, you don't have home run guys, then it's stupid. <laughs> if you, if you're trying to create contact and line drives, but the league has gone to more home runs and you have like, all right, well, what are you going to do? Like that's the team philosophy that's being just channeled through the hitting coach. Like it's, it's, you have to have a team that fits the philosophy that you're trying to do and using your hitting coach as, you know, the, the conduit for that. Like it, it, the league has gone back to, you gotta, you gotta park the ball got to park the ball in the seats and the the Cubs didn't pony up for a home run hitter is you can't tell me you can't tell me that the Cubs couldn't have put a package together for Juan Soto 
No, but they didn't seem to be interested at all in that. And I get, I get the Otani situation is they were there and, but he was not interested. There's nothing you can do about that. Yeah, that was, that was a, I can't blame the Cubs. They did their best effort without being detrimental to the team. And he was not interested in anywhere except the Dodgers. He just wanted the Dodgers to know that other teams that have deep pockets were going to come for him. You know, that was a, that was a, a using everybody else in some sort of seductive dance, but Juan Soto was available. You could have got him. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't seem interested. You didn't really want him. And that is a frustrating part because I don't think the Yankees are going to let him go without an extension. Even if it goes into the off season, I think, you know, there's a lot of talk about the Yankees probably needing to move money around and having to do, you know, a bunch of things, but I bet they find a way to keep him. It's just, it's really hard for me to see them parting ways with a superstar like that when you're in New York. I mean, you watch the duo of Aaron Judge and Juan Soto. There is not a baseball fan in the world that wouldn't have that on their team. No, and like the uh uh the what would be awesome is for a baseball per- perspective is the uh Judge Soto duo competing against the Betts Otani duo in the World Series. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. The East Coast versus the West Coast, the two best, you know, dynamic duos with the bats, the you know, the LA versus New York, the Dodgers met or the Yankees. That, that it's that's you know, Manfred is like every night he's he's giggling and cackling to himself thinking about that. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I mean the Dodgers and the Yankees just played each other series and you know, you heard electricity in that stadium. They were on national TV. It was a ratings bonanza. And, you know, that would be obviously a gold mine for baseball. And, you know, that's that's what you want to be. It's, it's like, listen, you might not be LA or New York, but you're Chicago. You're you're on that tier of, hey, we're a big market too. You know, we are the third largest market in the country behind Los Angeles and New York. And you want to feel that. And not always about dollars and cents spent. It's about the types of moves you make and the type of philosophy you have. And a philosophy of intelligent spending makes sense at some points, but it's 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 frustrating when it feels like Jed Hoyer has drawn the sign in the sand that they're willing to do certain things and more conservatively, so to speak. And you don't want to be reckless. You never want to be reckless, but you also want to, you know, shorten what you have, especially with the resources that you have, you know, the money, the farm system. I mean, you should be using that stuff to better your team. What's a shame, too, is we sit here and we think about a lot of the opponents and we look like, oh man, look at that guy in the lineup. We got to make sure we don't let that guy beat us. And whether it's Milwaukee or New York or LA, whatever, Atlanta, Philadelphia, there's the one guy in the lineup where you say, we can't let him beat us because he's going to crush if you make any sort of mistake. And you don't really have that on this team, really. No, but you do have a whole bunch of guys that if you bring in somebody like a a Juan Soto or if you would have brought in a Shohei Otani that would have had the potential to perform their best and play better because of that other person. Sure, absolutely. I don't know if you saw my tweet yesterday elaborating on the roster, but I said, you know, on an ideal World Series roster, Seiya Suzuki Bellinger should be like the second, third best hitters in your lineup. Ian Happ and Dansby Swanson should be the fourth and best hitters. 
Packers in up. That's all fine and good when you have that star potential in the middle of your lineup. You can yeah. imagine imagine this for a second. Imagine how good your team could be if you had in prime Rizzo, in prime Bryant on the corners, and you had what you're getting from Bellinger, Suzuki, and Hap when he's on a roll. That's a pretty good lineup. You can win yeah. with that. <clears throat> but you know, think about think about if you had if you were able to bring in a Soto and a Pete Alonso and you move assuming Ballinger opts out. You you're not you're definitely not that's a pipe dream with him still on the roster. But if you're able to bring enough pieces where you can move a Suzuki down to five or six in your batting order, that that might be the prime spot for him. Sure. And, you know, I recognize how good he can be, but, you know, there's been a lot of debate this week. Is he overpaid? I don't think he is. Bellinger or Suzuki? Suzuki. No, I I, 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 I think he's fine. I, I mean, he's he's hitting fine. He's got an OPS above, above 800 now. Um, no, no, he's very streaky, very streaky, and he's had some injury issues. But as a hitter, I, 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 I'm fine with what he. I getting. think, I think, some of the negativity about him and the fact that some people think he's overpaid is based on the injury history and the power we thought we were getting is not there. He's he's, and you know, part of that could be oblique injuries really zap power. It's just like a back injury. They, they do. And I think, I don't think he's ever gotten to a hundred percent. I think he's just plays through a lot of it, but yeah. you know, I, I think the con the contract is far from an albatross. I mean, isn't it, I offhand, I don't remember what it is, but isn't it a very similar one to uh, um, what's his face on the White Sox? What's uh, his face on the White Sox? Their highest paid player. Oh, uh, Ben Intendi. Ben Intendi. Isn't it a similar he, contract to Ben Intendi? I, I, yeah, I think that's a decent comparison, and he's been a lot better than Ben And Attendi. he's a whole lot better than Ben Intendi. And, you know, if you mathematically calculate his value it's it's pretty close to what he earns i think he's it's fine it's just i i think people just expected more power and the money that you are paying him you know could you have used that money and then some other monies that you could find to pay a superstar and that's a fair that's a fair thing to say could you have used a big chunk of the Hap and the Suzuki money and use that to pay uh, a Soto. Like uh, it's uh, you sure you could say that that's a, that's a much more fair argument, but I, I think Suzuki has been fine. Um, For me, the, the issue with the spend is you look at what you're paying Kyle Hendricks and Drew Smiley. I think that's a lot more damning than what you're paying. Like Cody, uh, Cody Bellinger, Ian Hap and say Suzuki. Yeah. And you're still, I think you're still paying Mancini and Barnhart money too. That's yeah. what bothers me. Not, not the value of Suzuki or a lot of people are bugged by Ian Happ. I'm not as bugged by him. Um, but there's definitely money on here where you wish it was going somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, you're always wishing you could. There's no team that doesn't have a contract somewhere where they're like, ah, I wish I was paying that guy a little less. Of course. Um, yeah, so say is 17 million a year. Um, Tyone is 17 million a year. Um, Hap is 20 million a year. Um, Hendrix, this is the last year of Hendrix. He's making just under 14. This is the last year, then he's done. Yeah, it's and I love Kyle Hendricks, but that's for too many. 
Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Smiley is say, but... nine and a half, and you've got. I don't know if there's an option for next year. If he's just, but um, it goes through next year. I don't know if there's an option or not. Um, or Smiley. Yeah, I, I I believe it is an option. Yes, Bodie Bodie makes three million a year. Yeah, so he's overpaid, but that that three million dollars is chump change. Yeah, that's not. It's not like you're paying him eight million. Yeah, um, you know. So it is. You don't. You know, there's not like all this fat you can trim. You you know. Hap, yeah, it would be nice to get more than twenty million dollars value. You know, he's probably overpaid much more so than Saya. Yes, yeah, I and again, I I like Ian, but for twenty million dollars, you'd like a little more power and a little more consistency. Yeah, I mean, you know, maybe if you factor in, he's a better defender than Saya and a better base runner, much better defender. Um, you know, maybe maybe things equal out a little bit, but Kyle Kyle Hendricks and Drew Smiley are the absolute just those are the that's the the low-hanging fruit of contracts that you can get rid of yes Uh, Um, if only it was like the nfl and you can convert it into signing bonus or some shit uh cut him and (laughs) eat the money walk away um other side of town man the white Sox are bad yeah i know they finally got a couple wins here against the Bo Sox, but they were on a 14 game losing streak. And that's, that's terrible, man. That is just, um, they're, they're all indications are that they are getting ready to, to start trading people. Uh, the Padres are apparently rumored to be heavily interested in Garrett Crochet. The White Sox are, are having talks about Luis Robert. Um, Mariners have popped up in those uh those rumors. Yeah. Um you know, you're you're going to try to flip your pitchers. Flexen his those last three starts have been pretty good. Um you know, his last three starts, five innings each one, two and run, one earned run, two earned run against Boston, Chicago and and Toronto. Uh moving up his trade value. Uh, Fetty, Fetty's been up and down a little bit more, um, but, but overall pretty good. Overall pretty good. Um, you know, if you look at his last seven games, it's pretty darn good. You look at his last three, uh, he had a, he had a real clunker in there versus Milwaukee, but he had a, he was stellar against Baltimore. Um, and then mag against the Cubs. So, but you know, you're going to flip those two guys. You're just going to anything that's not nailed down and I, you know, you're going to pull up all those young pitchers that you have. And that's, you're going to ride, you're going to ride with them the second half of the season. Right. Yeah. I mean, Drew Thorpe is going to be coming up and starting um, very, very soon. I think uh, this week uh, they just announced that he was being called up. Um, He's skipping triple a and coming to the majors. I don't know uh, what that entails. You know, is that is he going to get a taste of the majors? Is he going to stick around? How that's going to work? I don't know. But um, he's going to be coming up, and you're going to get a look at him. And Drew Thorpe has been outstanding in the minors, and he came over in the Dylan C steal, and he is looking really, really good. So that is something for White Sox fans to keep an eye on, look forward to, because if you look at the list of guys you're going to be trading. I mean, it's it's almost like this isn't like, uh, oh, hey, we're going to flip this, flip this, evaluate a lot of that. This is going to be pretty much a fire sale. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. If it's not like nothing is bolted down, everything is going to be sold. Paul DeYoung, gone. Luis Robert, sounds like he's going to be gone. Oh, yeah, he's going to be gone. Flexen, like you said. Uh, Fetty, Flexen, both going to be gone. Um, They will flip Luis Robert if they can, but I don't think they will be able to. I'm sorry, not Luis Robert, uh, Eloy Jimenez. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know if anyone's taking it. I don't I don't think anybody's going to take him unless unless he comes back and just on fire and somebody's desperate. Um but I I would be shocked if he's moved. Luis Robert will move. It's the interesting one is do they want to trade Garrett Crochet? That is the one I am wondering about. Because on one hand, he's a young pitcher and you want to build around. On the other hand, we don't know if he's going to have the stamina to do this all year. He's never done this before. And he's had some injury issues. So do you strike a trade while the iron is hot? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not like he's old. He's 24 years old. Uh, he's only a year older than than Thorpe. So, right, it, you know, the guy that you're like, oh, that 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 could be our dude. And by the way, he's pitching Tuesday against the Mariners. Um, Tuesday, okay. So it's they're they're essentially the same age. They're a year apart. So yeah. they both could easily be part of your your future. Your next, you know your next competitive team. So I, I mean, I think you're silly to trade him if, if you don't get, I mean, it's one thing if you just get the moon for him and, and you get all the treasure, like, all right, I can sort of get that because like you said, you don't know when he's going to hit a wall, if he'll hit a wall. And, uh, and if you can get a huge haul for him, then yeah, maybe that's, that's worth it. But I don't know. I, I, I would probably keep him guys that throw that kind of stuff. They're expensive and they're hard to get. Right. What do you think is going to happen with Michael Kopech? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, uh, we forgot Tommy Pham is going to be gone. Oh, right. I can't believe I forgot to mention Tommy Pham. He's been on the IL, so. So I'm going to fully admit that no spark. I was wrong. And Tommy Pham just loud. Yeah, I'm honestly, (laughs) I'm going to shame you for that one. I I am right now doing the shame finger gesture where I rub the one index finger on top of the other. I'm I'm doing that in your general direction. I will will take these two purple crayons and shove them up my nose and for the rest of the show <laughs> is <laughs> to, to, Tommy Pham Tommy Pham went on a loud tirade threatened to fight everybody and got hurt <laughs> I should just yeah. shut up Um, but he's going to get traded it's, oh yeah no kidding yeah uh, so yeah, they're, they're just they're going to this team is going to look completely different and and Gavin Sheets has to be considered you know I, I like I said, I is he's one of those guys that I don't know how other teams value him, but he's been he's been a productive player for the White Sox. So if you don't get something for him, I don't know. It's it's tough to trade him for nothing when he's worth something. Yeah, I mean, you might just flip him for pennies on the dollar, depending on what he does down the stretch here, because the overall not the, the not they're they're not good. A lot of strikeouts, but um, the FIP is high. The ERA is just mediocre. Um, the walks are high. So oh, I was saying, I was saying, Gavin oh. Gavin Sheets. Oh, I'm sorry. I I was still I still had. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. Yeah, Michael Kopech in my mind, but yeah, Gavin Sheets. I mean, he's been decently productive so yeah it's just one of those things it's like a guy like him on your team you're like okay you see his value and he's been a good team player he's played multiple positions there's been times he buoyed your team and made him at least competitive because he was your best hitter for a while and i don't know what the rest the rest of the league sees him as and i i don't know i wouldn't give him up for nothing kopech the other hand ah that I, I that feels like a change of scenery scenario to me. Is I, I'm going to throw this out there. Is what what if you package him with somebody to get him out of town? 
You could. So you don't, you're not just to get a sort of a salary. I think that's a possibility. I think so too. I think so too. I really do. I mean, that's there, there's um, never not a possibility of trying to package something together to get a really good deal somewhere. Um, and the question is in this fire sale, uh, who's more likely Who's more likely to be on the White Sox after the fire sale? Luis Robert or Pedro Grafal? Pedro Grafal. You think he's here all year? I, I I mean, how have been fired yet? If he's not getting fired now, then when? Does Jerry... Because I, I, I don't feel like Jerry wants to do it. Now, I don't think he's going to be here next year, but... If if you wait it out to like the midway point, your roster's all turned over and, you know, it's a new crop of people. You get rid of him at that point. So you're not poisoning these new players that are on your team, young players. And at a certain point, you know, you don't have to justify giving your bench coach or whoever replaces him any sort of raise. <laughs> <laughs> so you're not really paying two managers. You're paying Grafal to sit home and then you'll just pay your next manager. So I, I think it just works out the financials, but I, I, I think he'll get fired, but I think it'll be somewhere around the trade deadline. That's fair. That's fair. It just, to me, it's incredible that he's still here. Oh yeah. I mean it, there's no other way to justify it other than Jerry doesn't want to pay multiple managers. Right. And listen, we can talk about Chris gets situation all day. The only opinion that matters is Jerry. That's it. Oh, absolutely. He does not care about anybody else's opinion and any, any source that's the says... David Steiner branch, Ricky. <laughs> and there's really only one media source that really had, if you know, uh, that has the ear of Jerry, not the ear, but he's, he's the mouthpiece for Jerry. Any other time you hear a rumor about the White Sox, yeah, anytime you hear a rumor from the White Sox, if it's not, if it's not coming from one particular source, then it, it, you don't believe it because Jerry's pretty, Jerry runs a tight ship as far as rumors go. And when Bob Knight and Gail report, they want that out there. Yes. Yes. And when it's Nightingale, that means he's told Nightingale and Nightingale is meant to get it out there. Otherwise, I mean, you don't know what Jerry's thinking because Jerry's not telling you. Right. So he, right. he's got a, he's got a small circle and they're not talking. Um, now, did you, did you see Ken Rosenthal's piece that got, um, that got quite a bit of attention? I did. And it, it, it kind of your point right there. It's like, oh, okay. Um, is this all speculation? Was this heard somewhere? Is this getting out there on purpose? What's the deal? You know, and yeah, here's, I don't a, know. here's the thing. If, if I'm a manager that's about to get, that might get fired and I'm not hearing any sort of, uh, you know, I guess, assurances from my boss is you know one option is you have your agent float information and then you see how the team responds true so there's a lot true. of games that get played in the media is i don't think i don't i think he's going to get fired i think he deserves to get fired well yeah i, I don't think that any of that came from the the White Sox brass or ownership. I don't think so. Oh, either. I, I don't I, think so either. I think that came from another camp. I don't think so. I don't think it's made up by any stretch, but I don't think it was coming from the White Sox. So that source is probably Pedro's agent or Pedro himself. I mean, do you think Pedro's trying to play his way out of here? That's a possibility too. That's a real possibility that it's just, he's, it's a, I mean, he's in a tough spot. He's not good. And his team is really bad and he's hurting his prospects of future jobs. 
um, that maybe I can, he's trying I can to force his way out. He's never going to be a big league manager after this. No, no. He'll be a bench coach somewhere. You know, he'll make solid money and, uh, you know, be able to, you know, help some organization out in some fashion. But uh, I see no way that he's going to be a manager after this. No, no, no chance. None chance. This was his one shot. And, you know, it's I get I get that there's only 30 jobs of that nature in, you know, in baseball. But sometimes you got to say, as much as I want this, is this the right situation? Can I make this team win? And if you can't, you know, you're going to get shit on. So, and we understand, and you and I both understand that the roster wouldn't win with Bruce Bochy. Magic. No. We can agree with that, right? Absolutely. But the way that it's handled, there is a disconnect between between the players and the manager when Corey Lee speaks to that publicly when Pedro Grafol can't properly explain why he called his team out when Pedro Grafol you know for whatever reason insists that there was no need to pinch hit for Martin Maldonado who was batting 071 you wouldn't even get a DUI with that batting average um you know when he's he's batting him you know, there's just like, okay, you watch this and you're like, this is, this, this is clearly not a well captain ship. Um, the ship is already full of holes and the one that built the ship didn't build the ship very well, but it's not being led very well. And it's pretty obvious. It's very, very obvious. And I, did you see the clip of Luis Robert in the dugout the other night? I did not. So it's kind of subtle, and I don't know if we're overthinking this, but it was the end of the game against the Red Sox. They lost 14 in a row, and they cut to, because they always like to cut to the the White Sox dugout at home, and they like, okay, game's over. We're going to clear out. We're gathering our bags, our bats, our gloves, our big league chew, and they're packing up for the dugout. And sitting at the top of the dugout on the bench is Luis Robert. And he just kind of like, he just kind of did this gesture. Like, I'm so done with this shit. Like, wasn't it last year when it was pretty clear that White Sox players made it pretty clear they weren't happy with where they were? Yes. And I think that with all the stories that came out, it was pretty clear that the culture was not good. And listen, winning cures a lot, and you're not going to win with this group, but, you know, you can look at other bad teams. Like, the rebuilding White Sox under Ricky Renteria, you never really sensed there was a toxic culture there. You just weren't good because you were rebuilding, you didn't have talent. This is, you don't have talent, you don't have a good leader, and you just, you, the, the culture just, just doesn't seem very good. There is a difference. I still contend that Ricky Ricky got done dirty. Uh, I think you needed to make a change. You just shouldn't have hired Tony La Rosa. That's, I mean, if you move, if you make a move and you bring in somebody legit, okay. Like Joe like, Madden? If you bring in a Joe Madden, I... I still don't like the way the Ricky got handled, but I, from a, a winning perspective, yeah, you make that, you make that decision 11 times out of 10. But when you do it with the corpse of Tony La Russa, um, that's, that's doing somebody dirty. You brought glug, in, glug, glug. yeah, you brought in an alcoholic racist corpse of a man to replace you. Like, as bad as you know did they need to do better yes but they did worse and then they did they doubled down and went even worse after that yeah i mean like you know all the all the fire tony chants that we heard it's like honestly right now you would think old tony la Russa over pedro Grafal. you i honestly would is is you can't you can't find a white Sox fan that wouldn't in a heartbeat if they, you said 
I can snap my finger and make Pedro Grafal go away and replace him with Ricky Renteria. I guarantee you, you would not find a White Sox fan that would say no to that. And I would bet you'd be hard sure. pressed. I bet you'd be a hard pressed to find a player on that team that wouldn't want to do that. You're probably right. You're is Ricky Renteria is very probably, well liked as yes, a, he is. a manager. Yes, he is. He might not be the best tactical manager, but he's very well liked. And I think he's good at individually coaching guys up. Yeah. I thought if you, if you were the Cubs and you could have, if you could have played that right, you could have made him a high profile, like roaming minor league uh, manager or, you know, coach that goes from team to team and oversees things and helps develop players i think that would have been a good fit for him i think it would have been a good fit for the cubs i but i get why he wouldn't want to um it's very rare to demote a coach and he yes. stays in the same org like it was pretty cool when Dick king of the blackhawks took the bench coach after being the interim head coach when they brought in luke richardson but that's pretty rare yeah it's it's rare and I, I understand why he didn't do it that, but I think if you play that right, you, that would have been amazing, but I, I, you know, he's for whatever flaws he has, he's so much better than Pedro Grafal. Yeah. It, it's hard to get worse than Pedro Grafal. And I mean, listen, I'm sure that Pedro Grafal was a valuable bench asset in uh, Kansas city. He was there for so long. He was there when they won the world series there was a reason he stuck around there, but there was also a reason he didn't get a job. You know, it's like, hey, he's good at what he does, but uh, taking the next step into managerial position eh, and maybe not his choice. So I think that's showing more and more clear right now. So I want to I want to discuss one more thing with the White Sox and parlay that into another thing is if we think we have a catching problem in a catcher problem and with an old catcher on the Cubs, Martin Maldonado is not only playing or playing bad defensively. His slash line is 071, 124, 111. His, his slugging 111. He's, he's slugging like half his body weight. Ugh. And the framing is bad. And then you've got you've got John Schriffens talking about you know the momentum for him to get an all star nod. Oh. I what is, like is was the reason he was hired is to be a yes man for this team. Yes, because it's, yes, it's he's real, a huge. It's really painful to watch him just sound like a jerk out there and it's so bad when steve stone has to just like laugh him off like when he made the comment about martin maldonado and and the push to get him to be an all-star and steve stone is just like okay (laughs) well he was brought in for this certain reason and that's why pedro gafold tried to put him in the lineup well well, you know, uh, it seems like the problem with the White Sox is they're meeting all the teams at the wrong time. Well, yes, uh, uh, among a few others, <laughs> <laughs> Steve Stone put it. Uh, Steve Stone, Steve Stone is pulling pun like he's doing his best to pull punches because you know what he's thinking. Like you could, you could see him. He's he's rocking back to throw a 90 mile an hour fastball and he's just like all right let me throw a change up on this one <laughs> because he's he wants his job still but it's it's painful to watch because steve stone you know like when he left the cubs there was there was some bitterness between the team and the players and steve stone and a lot of bitterness yeah, and I think he learned a bit of a lesson when he went to the White Sox and he became especially working with Hawk Harrelson, who's an ultimate rah-rah guy. And Jerry Ryan's it's it's I think he 
learned a, a lesson and he's been much more of a company guy even even if he's still going to be honest about things he tones it down and it's i think it's really difficult for him to be with john Schriffens, who is uh, just a uh i i can't i wanted to give him benefit of the doubt but so did i the the fact that you you let a guy that's actually really good walk and then to bring in this guy and now he's feuding with the you know people from the score yeah like, you know how dumb that is yeah and uh just yeah i i, I try to give him the benefit of the doubt too but yeah it's it's kind of painful to listen to and i don't really i don't really know with this new and I, I'm sure we'll talk about this at some point with this new broadcasting deal that the White Sox, the Bears, or the Bulls and Blocks are going to have. Could this be a one and done deal? I don't know. I, I really don't know. But um, it's tough, tough to listen to. Yeah, I I want well, I want been wanting to discuss that new broadcast deal. I just I'm waiting for more information to kind of come out. Because I, um, you know, I don't think NBC Sports Chicago has been bad. Uh, I'm just curious of what this is going to be like, and I, and I don't know. And it's hard. It's going to be hard to judge it because the whole landscape of regional sports broadcasting is at a crossroads. Right. I mean, even the Cubs have have talked about like. You know, like Marky and Cubs having their own network, I think, I think is fine, but they're having struggles with things. They, it's not the same market it was five years ago when they talked about having their own network. Had the, had the Cubs gotten the marquee off the ground five years ago, I think we'd be in a different boat. Um, it's just a different, they wanted landscape. to be the yes network. I think they wanted to be, is, is that the Yankees network? Yes. Okay. I think they wanted to be whatever the Dodgers have. Yeah, that's uh, probably, that. yeah, you, that's probably more accurate. Yes. Uh, you know, the Dodgers, you know, they did it at the right time. Um, and they're did it reaping, right. And they did it right. They're reaping the benefits. And I think the Cubs, it was a little, a little late. Not Nothing they did wrong. It's just the timing of it didn't work out. They, they had a contract. Um, well, and, and plus you, you, kicked off that network in a panic year yes it, it was just the timing was so horrible yes you were you Agreed. were in you were in a sell-off you were in a, a pandemic year and the landscape had changed significantly and so uh, cable networks weren't eager to just pick up another sports network so it was just the awful timing and this new one is is probably just as bad a timing is you have the white Sox are terrible. The, the Blackhawks are terrible. The bulls are terrible. And you're going to try to sell this to, to cable packages. And I know they're right off the bat. They're supposed to, you know, be able to stream it like you can marquee that did this year, but how many people are going to want to pay for that? Yeah. I mean, like, I th- you, the products, the product on a field court ice has got to be worth it first. Yeah, I mean, I you get marquee through Comcast, right? Mm-hmm. So I, I don't have a cable provider. So this this season, I have been paying twenty dollars a month for marquee, and it sucks because they're not playing worth twenty dollars for me a month. I just I just picture you going on like the shadiest website possible trying to like get like a pirate stream and you know I uh, last year so last year I struggled because um we got rid of of cable and I had my mom had uh she had uh AT&T Uverse and I would log in through her password and they have Uverse has marquee. So I was watching it. And then during like halfway through the season, they got rid of it and went to YouTube TV, which 
I'll be honest, I like better, but they don't have marquee. So um, I was like, shit. So I was like, all right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get MLB TV because I, I was, I was taking uh, MBA courses at night. So I had a dot edu email. So I got MLB TV for like $50 for the year, something stupid. Hmm. Hmm. And I was like, okay, well then I'm going to get a VPN and watch the Cubs that way. And it worked for a couple, like a week or two. And then it's, they caught on and then I couldn't get them anymore, which, but it was fine because my wife is a Phillies fan. So she watched all the, she watched the Phillies every night. So she was happy, but I was like, man, so I would go to friends' houses or go to bar restaurants or whatever to watch the Cubs or just listen. To, I mostly listen to the radio broadcast, which yeah, is fine. Yeah, I got Pat Hughes to do that. Yeah, which is go fine on. because I I prefer the radio broadcasters anyway, um, but it's nice to watch the game. And so this year I was like, they, they offered the option of just streaming it. And I was like, man, $20 a month sucks for that. It's more than HBO. Um, so I pay that. But it's they they haven't been good. It hasn't been fun to watch. It's it's agonizing. Yeah, I know. But at least at least I I can say all of the Cubs broadcasters, even if I, you know, prefer the radio. All of the broadcasters are good. The, yeah, I don't I don't have anything vehemently against any of them. No, I mean, it's I, hard to be Pat Hughes. Yeah. Pat, Pat and Ron are great. They are. And I don't know all the situation going on, but you know, you're, you're seeing Pat or hearing Pat less and less, but, um, but they're, they're all every, every single announcer TV and radio for the, the Cubs are better than John Schriffen's. Yeah. I, uh, I gotta tell you, I, I have that feeling in my gut, even if he doesn't, even if he says otherwise, I just have my feeling that Pat Hughes is it, it's it's starting to wind down here, so to speak. Yeah, he's I'm getting, getting older. I'm getting the Hawk Harrelson feeling where you know he's he's winding himself down and not just gonna you know pull the plug on it completely, but you know maybe he doesn't maybe he starts doing a home series only or. Doesn't go to like the West Coast trips or anything like that. Yeah, I think we're gonna start seeing that, and which is a bummer. Yeah, that uh, the days Nongar broadcaster is gonna be really. Sick. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we. I guess we could parlay this right into the Blackhawks. Yeah. Is Vosters was out, um, and which is good because I don't think he was very good. And I, I I don't I don't think he was ready for that job. I really don't. I, you know he wasn't terrible, but uh, just wasn't good. And we're used to, and, and the fact that we lost one of the best, yes, and replaced him with Vosters was a slap in the face, and I. I feel bad for him because I don't think he was ready for this. And I think right. it wasn't the market for him because the Blackhawks, the Blackhawks fans have high expectations of our announcers. You're Chicago. You're an original 16. Um, you, you just straight up need an experienced, proven, respected guy in the industry. And I think Voster seems like a great dude. He seems like he worked very hard, but I, yeah, I I just think it, it, he wasn't ready for this level yet. Just wasn't. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, that's Rick Ball is going to team up with Darren Pang. I, I thought Darren Pang was a good hire. Oh yeah, a Pang. Uh, I mean, is long been in this game and very well respected by his peers. Yeah. So Rick Ball is going to be replacing uh, Vosters, and. Um, and so you're you're going to have a veteran guy going with uh, with Panger. And I think um, I, I think it's going to be a much a much better uh, duo. 
And if you watch the the Stanley Cups uh, playoffs for TNT last year, is Rick Ball was the the this the uh, TNT play by play guy. Yes, he's very good. He's been the Flames announcer for the past ten years, and I saw Flames fans on social media who were very upset that he was leaving, and like uh, not upset as in screw him but upset am we're losing rick ball that really stinks the people were saying oh you know i remember when kachuk left i remember when this player left that player left this more like the fact that you're seeing those kind of words come from flames fans really tells you how good of an announcer he was yeah i mean he was he was with vancouver then went to the flames uh now he's with the blackhawks and um i think the blackhawks fans will be uh you know, I think, I think there'll be, it's a good situation for him too, because uh, he's not replacing Eddie O. He's replacing the guy that replaced Eddie O. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're never going to get the duo of Pat and Eddie, but uh, I think Rick Ball and Panger is pretty darn good. Yes. And what I'm hoping for is that we're just, it felt like such a revolving door to last year you know, with other guys stepping in and it's like, you just kind of want some consistency and I understand that Panger is going to miss some games because he does a lot of uh, national broadcast stuff too. But you want the, can you want like a, a nice con- consistent chemistry uh, between Panger and Rick ball. And I think you're going to get that. Yeah, I think so too. Is they're both, they're both veteran guys and, you know, uh, uh, and as cool of a job, like, I mean, I, I like the Calgary Flames. Um, and, but, you know, him leaving that job, he said it was, it was too good of a opportunity to pass up because, you know, going from Calgary to Chicago, like Calgary is a fine place, but um, it's, it's no Chicago. To announce for, for an original team, in a big market with a rising superstar in Connor Bedard and hopefully what's a better ball club next year. Um, I I think there's plenty of reasons to, you know, like that. And this is one of the scenarios where you're moving to a, quote, cold winter market, but you were also in Calgary before. So it's uh, not like you're going from Florida from Chicago. You're going to sometimes even colder to Chicago. So, uh, yeah, I think there's... Despite where the teams last year and despite the long go, I think there was plenty of appeal for Rick Ball to come to Chicago. And I'm really, really glad he's here. I think this is an exciting Blackhawks. And this is something that big market teams like the Blackhawks should be doing. And I hope that this is truly a a sign of the time because the last few years, we saw Danny Wirtz take over. You know, Rocky Wirtz is gone. The old era is completely out the door. You now have Connor Bedard. And it, it, it you felt like, you know, you're trying to find a new identity. And you're trying to try new things. I mean, you know, Pat Foley hiring. I, I'm still not convinced it was 100% choice. Uh, so hopefully this is a sign of you're finding some stability in what you want this team's identity to be, and you're you're taking steps forward to being more relevant again. Because yes, the Blackhawks were on national games last year because of Connor Bedard, but you were people were only watching the Blackhawks because of Connor Bedard. You want to see the Blackhawks be viewed as more than just an awful Connor Bedard. You want to see them start to take shape in their next era. You want to see them, you know, present themselves again as a big market team. And I just think a lot of the times last year with both the on ice product and, you know, your the presentation of your product, you weren't really getting that. Right. Um, so it's it's funny. Uh, so Patrick Kane is now a free agent. And I think we've all or both of us have are on the you know what that that ship has sailed we'll pass on that no no offense to Kaner just it's not a fit for where we are right now 
but I've heard reports that that internally the Blackhawks have had that discussion about potentially bringing Kane back. They have, but it also seems like when Kyle Davidson spoke at the combine, he's kind of somewhat shut that stuff down. Yeah, but he's also I He hasn't blatantly said it, but Yeah, I I he's I mean, what his words are makes you think that it's closed door. But also, I don't know how much I trust what he says at face value because after he sp- finally spoke about the the trade that they made recently about the with the draft picks, mm-hmm. and he's like, and he's just like, no, there's no other move. There's just we just thought this was good value. Like, um, I mean, yeah, no. like the, the, tra- the, the trade chart doesn't say it's a good value. It was, you know, it wasn't all terrible, but it was it definitely f- didn't favor you, and. Like, so th- there's, there's something else that you're thinking about, or you think somebody's going to fall or, or you want to be within striking distance, or you wanted to be ahead of somebody that you leapfrogged. Like there's some reason you don't make a trade that early on. So I just, I don't know how much I believe about what he's saying. Uh, I, I don't think Kane is, you know, necessarily, uh, the right option for this team at this age, his age, but it would be fun to watch. I wouldn't be mad if they did it. No, neither would I, but I don't think it advances this team any further. I'm, I'm not vehemently against the idea. Like if Kyle Davidson came out and said, Hey, we want to do this. I'm not going to object in any way. My whole point is if they want to white, if they want want to just close that chapter and be done with it, so be it. That that's it, like I'm not going to sit here and say I don't want Kane back no matter what, but I I fully accepted the the idea that they might just want to say you know what we closed the door and that's that okay okay if you have a plan which I think you do I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt for now fine that's fine yeah it, it's it's you know when I say I don't want him back it's not has nothing to do with his skill i show, think he played really well last year played um, very well with the red Wings, and yes. it's nothing about him as a, as a player it's nothing him as an ex blackhawk like I, I like him i would i would love to see him finish his career in that sweater it's my perspective is where the blackhawks are right now and what is going to make them better as a team and i don't think him patrick kane is making them better team now if you say listen it's we're trying to get butts in the seats and him on a line with with bedard is going to put butts in the seats while you know we lose again next year all right that's fine if you tell me hey we want a veteran that can score a lot to be on the same line as bedard to give him better weapons to so you know helps him grow and utilize him better okay i'm okay it's just I don't want them to be like sign him because like he was here for a long time and we like him. I, I want there to be a, a real rationale and it has to be about improving us as a team or improving Connor Bedard. Right. Right. And I think that based on what Kyle Davidson said at the end of the year is it's time to do both, but you know, there's gotta be a plan to it too. You know, the, the plan of attack and I don't know if you've seen this, but it seems like there's a bit of smoke, nothing too thick, but there's there's a bit of surround Jay Gensel. I'm not going to happen, but I've heard multiple times that name come up for the Blackhawks. Yeah, I've heard that. I, but I don't know at this point, I don't know what's smoke, what's not smoke. Um, Right. And so it's something that's just out there. Uh, yes. Um, but you know, you've got, you've got the draft coming up in a few weeks. Um, and then I believe, I believe free agency opens up as soon as the draft is like the day after the draft ends or the two days after the draft ends. It's like right when the draft ends, um, then free agency starts. So we're like three weeks away from, from all of that. So 
right now is lying season, just like it is in the NFL. Nobody's going to tell you their plan. And, and that leads my, to my the one last thing I want to talk about the Blackhawks is it seems like we all know who's going to be number one in the draft. Mm-hmm. And the draft really starts at who are the Blackhawks taking at number two. And it seems like it's going to be between Demidov, the the winger from Russia, mm-hmm. or uh, Lev- Levshimov, the defenseman from Michigan State. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I, I mean, do you have a preference at this point? No, um, is it, but I think that the thing is, if you draft the guy from Michigan State, it feels safer in the sense of you're going to, you're going to be able to control his timeline better because Demidov is still playing over in Russia, isn't he? Yes. And Things can get a little complicated. So, but I mean, Demidov might be the better player. So, I don't know. It's, it's, you used the word that was like literally what I wrote down when I chose who I would pick if, if it was my, my choice. And, and it was the word safe is Mm -hmm. I think Levshimov is, you know, he's going to be, he's going to be ready to play for you next year. There's no sort of rights issues. Um, He's, he's already got an NHL frame. He's got NHL skating ability. Uh, He's got an offensive mindset. Um, He's, he's very Brent Burns ish. And I think, I think he fills a need. I think his floor is pretty darn high. I don't, His ceiling, his ceiling is a number one defenseman slash uh, first first unit power play guy, and his floor is is uh, you know a, a two or three defenseman. I think I, I, I think he's got a pretty high floor. Demidoff, the, the and we also seen Levshimov like arguably have one of the best seasons of a defense as a defenseman in in recent college memory like he's been fantastic mm-hmm. uh demidoff he played almost all in the mhl and not the khl so like they're minors and so we haven't seen him play even against the best russian players so sure it's uh it's you know you you're he's more raw. Projecting. We can. Yes. I, th- I think you could say he's more raw. Yes, and I've heard people say uh, the guy that was in last year's draft, uh, Mitchkov, that um, Demidov beat him out for a roster spot, and so people kind of use that as an apples to apples comparison. But you know, his his upside is if you know if you tell me both guys' ceilings is a number one defenseman slash first team power play guy versus a point, a game player. Yeah. I'm probably going to take Demidoff, but um, you know, he's got super high upside. He's very Artemi Panarin type, but I, I've read that there's some chinks in the armor as far as his skating ability. Um, so I Which just, doesn't really go with what the Blackhawks have been trying to build. Yes, they've they've really gone with speed for their their forwards and length on their defensemen. And Demidov, I like he's. I don't know if he fits that. Leshkimov or uh, Leshkimov, he fits that long, and he's so I, that's who I would go with. I'm not going to cry if they pick go the other way. I'm I'm trusting the process here, but I think that's where they're going to go. And I think that's where I would go to. I think it's just, it's a safer option. But if you tell me that, you know, their philosophy is, Hey, you know, we know we're not going to be good next year, but we don't anticipate a top three pick again next year. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe six, seven, eight, and we're going to take our swing at the fences, you know, right now then okay but i just think i think the defenseman is the safer pick 
Yeah, no, I think that's all fair. Uh, um, and you can look at this thing too. Is is look where some of the Blackhawks' notable picks have been. Look at Frank Nazar. You know, he played at Michigan. He played college hockey, and you know, there, there's something to be said when you play for some of these college programs. Kind of to the point of what you've been talking about is you have a bit more of an edge, I think, in development because you're not as raw. And you can kind of say that similarly, too, about like baseball draftees. Remember when the Cubs drafted Chris Bryant and Kyle Schwarber, you know, going with college drafts for some boppers where they're a bit more polished. They have a bit more of a pedigree. And I, I feel like, you know, take this defenseman uh, from Michigan State you're you're getting a more polished player, and if you're gonna get this rebuild going, then it might be better to have something that's maybe a tad more quote certain and less of a project. So I could totally see that being Davidson's thought process, but we'll see for sure when the time comes. Yeah, so we'll see. Yeah, I think we'll learn more about him as a guy because we. Drafting Bedard, you know, every single GM was going to do that. They had the opportunity. So it'll be interesting to see more of a who he is as a as a GM when he makes this this pick. Because this is this is the first big option. Uh because Celebrini's going first. And so that's it's a foregone it's, conclusion. Yeah. I mean the the NHL brought him in. We're like, who's going to get you? Who's going to draft you here? Here's the, the lottery. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there, there's no way. I mean, it's like Connor Bedard last year. There was yeah. zero question. Yeah. So it's, it's this draft starts here. Um, it kind of like last year, the, you know, what did, where did they go second? So it was a, it'll be interesting to see how the Blackhawks um, do this. I'm looking for to it i'm looking forward to the draft i'm looking forward to seeing how davidson handles this next this next step in this rebuild because the draft is going to be important free agency is going to be important because if you're going to be serious about at least getting back to somewhat responsibility next year you're going to have to make some notable moves you know on top of further developing your prospects you know we're going to see a frank nazar play more than just a few games. He played at the end of the year. You saw some good things. You're going to see him further develop at this level. You're going to get your first real good sample size look at him. And then you're going to get the sophomore year of Connor Bedard. And, you know, hopefully you'll have a healthy Taylor Hall. And if you could bring in a few more notable friends, you know, maybe not superstars, but guys who have been around, who have a pedigree, then... Yeah, then it's it's key to taking that next step here. Right. Um so uh, moving this along a little bit uh I j- one bulls thing is I don't know if you saw Chet Walker died. I did. Yeah. Uh that's a, you know, it's sad. Um he's he was a one of the original Bulls Ring of Honor guys played six years for the Bulls. He's in the NBA Hall or the Basketball Hall of Fame. Um, so he uh, unfortunately passed away. So condolences to him and his family. Well, did you also hear that Billy Donovan's son was hired? Was it to run the Windy City Bulls or something? Yeah. yeah typical. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, it's kind of like uh, Steve Kerr's son getting hired to coach the, uh, the San was it the Santa Cruz warriors. Yeah. It's like, they're trying to cheaply mimic what more successful teams are doing. Yes. And I just, I feel like Steve Kerr didn't think about what he, his son, when he named his son, his name is Nicholas Kerr. Oh uh, yeah. Oh I didn't yeah. Know that. Yeah. He didn't think about that nickname. Mm. Well, just, just keep calling Nicholas. Yeah, he is, he's Nicholas forever. Or call him Gus. Like, just something off the wall. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, so let's wrap this up with some bears. Sure. 
Um, we are at the end of the the mandatory mini camp, so we won't see veterans again until uh, until training camp opens. Um, but we at least know the Bears' training camp schedule. Um, so we're uh, let me pull that up because my internet's being slow. Uh, uh, uh. It is. Uh, bah, bah. Open practice starts July 26. And so they'll about have a week of practice before that first game, which is August 1st in the, the Hall the, of Fame game, the Hall of Fame game against the Houston Texans. Um, so we've seen the end of of these these the veterans until actually training camp opens. And but we we did see a lot of improvement from Caleb Williams as these, these camps went on. And I don't know if you saw that throw he made flick of the wrist bomb to Valus Jones. Yeah, that was beautiful. I think we're finally going to see the benefit of having Valus Jones on the roster this year between the new kickoff rules and his speed with Caleb Williams arm. I think we're going to, I think we're finally going to see some value and return on that Valus Jones investment. I'm not saying, I hope he's so. gonna, I'm not saying he's going to be, you know, an elite guy, but I think we're finally going to be like, all right, I'm not mad at him anymore. There's a purpose for him on this roster. He is off my shit list. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, did you hear the, uh, the bears news today? Uh, yeah. Mercedes Lewis is going to resign tomorrow. Yeah, and I think that's that's just a nice veteran piece to have on the team. He's obviously not going to be in the scorecard very much, but um, you know he was here last year. He worked with the number of these guys. You know, obviously he was on the tandem with Cole Komet and you know a bunch of the guys that are still here on the offense. And you know, having Caleb Williams a year that'll you know it'll benefit to have another experienced and very well respected veteran on this team. Yeah, I mean. The guy is the guy has been playing probably almost as long as Caleb Williams has been alive. And so uh, he's been playing since 2006. Yeah, he's in, in the NFL. Uh, yeah, this is this is a long time for him. Um, and. He is last year, I think he was third in the NFL as a blocking tight end in the rating. So he's still playing at a high level and he just plays a very niche piece. It's he's in there on big packages. And if you need to, him to catch a ball in a, for a first, a short first down or on goal line, he absolutely can do that. You're not sending him out on a 20 yard route or anything. He has a, oh, no. he has a place. Um, uh, so it's a, it's, he has a place and it's just very good. And also he is an absolute, like, he's a guy that doesn't get injured and he's an absolute locker room, like superstar. He is a good teammate, a good dude. And I think that will be huge for, for Caleb Williams to have a professional like that around. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, that, that was a nice little piece of news today. And I, I, I kind of had that feeling that you we're going to see him come back, but uh, it's nice to see it official. Yeah, I mean, I honestly didn't think they would be this early. I assumed it would be closer to training camp, but you know, if you get him wrapped up, it's. It, I knew it would be after the mandatory mini camp. There was no way he's a he's a veteran that doesn't get injured. He knows he knows what he does, and he's going to learn that playbook perfectly fine. Um, and he's going to, I you know, he just he doesn't need all those, those reps and practices. So my assumption was it would be sometime between literally soon as the, the mandatory mini camp was done and training camp opened. So we're exactly in that window and he's, he's back. And I think, you know, is you know, the beauty of it is he, he's going to take close to league minimum, if not league minimum. And it's one year deals. And if he, doesn't pick up this offense or doesn't play well, you can cut him. It's not a big deal. 
but I think he's just going to be, he's going to be huge in there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, he's, he played from 2006 to 2017 with Jacksonville, 2018 to 2022 with the Packers and 2023 and 2024 with the bears. And he's still going. So, yeah, yeah. He's been around a long time. I mean, he's 40 years old now and he made his debut his NFL debut the year we went to the Super Bowl. Um, yeah, I mean, so it's funny because he'll be, he played against Marvin Harrison senior and he'll be playing against Marvin Harrison jr. That's pretty cool. So Caleb Williams was five when Mercedes Lewis started playing in the NFL. That's nuts. Um, well, I remember, uh, who was the old kicker that kicked forever for the lions for the lions? Yeah. He kicked for them until he was like 44 years old. I know Matt Bryant was around a long time. No, no. God, I can't think of his name. He wasn't um, with the lions. He was with the, yeah. The Falcon. I mean, I think of long kickers. I think of Matt Bryant. I think of Sebastian Janikowski. Um. Uh, I'll think of it. But uh, was it Longwell around for a long time? Yes. Um. Jason Hansen. Oh. Okay. Yeah, he played in the league for like twenty years, and uh, all for the Lions and. They, his last year, there were players on the team that weren't alive when he got drafted. Yeah, that's that's hilarious. Like, that's funny. Like, you show up, you know, you're like, hey, Rook. And he's he's been playing in the league for 20 years, and you've got like a 19 or a 20-year-old on the team. It's like when he was drafted, just, that kid wasn't born. Yeah. Um, but... Yeah, Mercedes Lewis is going to be is going to be something like that. Um, you know, there's what is how old is Roman Dunze? I'm sure I'm sure the Bears have somebody that's that's 21 or 22 that they draft. I think I think Roma Dunze is the youngest player on the team. Yeah, so I think you're right. So it's the the age difference between those two is just astronomical. Yeah, it's pretty uh pretty re- Remarkable when you see things like that. Uh, you know that both Caleb and Roma Dunze and a lot of those other teammates are going to continue to look up to Mercedes Lewis on the team. So, um, yeah, just just a just a good 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 guy to have on the team. Yep. Um, but so uh, that was uh, I was happy to see that. I was pretty sure it was going to happen, and I, I was hoping it happened. And it now that it's it's. It's not official. I think it's tomorrow he's signing, but he's the report is that he's flying into Chicago specifically to sign the contract. So yes. I'm assuming it's going to be a done deal. Yep. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, I saw some of the defensive players is the defense is already that, especially that the backfield is, is playing really well. And they're talking about multiple players. I've heard talk about that. They want to have a, the, that that defense hit the 2020 club 20 interceptions and 20 forced fumbles this season. Mm, it's a big tall task. That is a tall task. And if you, uh, if you hit that, this team, this team is probably going to be real good. Yes. So it gets me to my opinion question here. What, what do the bears look like? Best case scenario. Record wise? Not record wise, as far as, you know, their, where they rank offense and defense and, and, you know, how do they make the postseason and how far could they go? Like, what's best case scenario? So I think if you ask me right now, best case scenario is, Top 10 defense, top 15 offense, 
you get into the playoffs and maybe you win a game. That's my opinion. Best scenario. Obviously NFL, a lot could happen better, worse, whatever. But that to me, I think is best case scenario. Do I think it's going to play out that way? I don't really know, but I think that's that to me is best case scenario because I think your defense good. I don't know if it's top five, but I think it could be top 10. Um, the offense, I don't think it's going to be top 10, but you could be top 15 if Caleb Williams shows promise. Um, and because your schedule is so light, you can win enough teams to make the playoffs. And if you get in the playoffs, depending on the matchup, you know, maybe you get your way into a win. So I don't see him as a great team, a super team, anything like that. I think the good defense, not the best. I think you could have a solid offense if Caleb Williams is good and you have a chance. I mean, like I said, if your schedule was a lot more difficult, I'd be a bit more skeptical on that. I'm not even saying they're going to make the playoffs, but I think it's there. there is a possibility that they can because of that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm a little more optimistic than you, but pretty darn close is I I think best case scenario is that defense is number six. I don't think I agree with you. I don't think that without another opposite edge rusher and, and my, my being six takes into account. Austin Booker has a pretty good rookie season. Yes. Um, But I don't think, I think the fact that uh, there are still not, I'm not sold on them as run stoppers in the middle of that defensive line and I'm worried about the other edge rusher. I don't think they can get in top five. So I said six, maybe seven is like that peak, but I think that's still pretty darn good. And offense, I agree with you. I don't think they'll hit top 10. I had them slightly better than, than top 15. I thought best case scenario around 12. Okay. Um, and uh, I think the best case scenario, they could fare a little bit better than the Texans did last year in the playoffs. Um, just, and it would be solely, I mean, the Texans ran into a really good team. I think it would, the bears playing better will be, uh, if they play better through the season, they'll get a little bit of an easier path. I think they could win one, maybe two games in the playoffs. I think that's best case scenario. And I don't think that's an impossible scenario either. I think just, there's a couple things that I'll talk about afterwards that that have to go right. Right. Now, worst case scenario, where are you going? Where are you going here? Worst case scenario, I think six, seven wins. Um, obviously not in the playoffs. Caleb Williams either gets hurt or struggles, and the defense is okay. It's not good enough to stop teams because you can't get to the quarterback enough and uh, they're just going to get worn down by lack of offense. Uh, Yeah. I see worst case scenario. Your defense is somewhere around 15, 16, and it's going to be difficulty stopping the run and or injuries to that, to some of your starters that are tough to, to uh, fill. Yeah. Offense. My biggest concern is if because if you can keep that offensive line healthy, even if Caleb Williams gets hurt, if you keep those wide receivers and that offensive line healthy, I think Tyson Bagent can at least get you a few wins to to make the record look okay. Sure, kind of uh, like last year. Yeah, except, until the last week of the season. Yeah, I just but you know if you keep him upright and he has much better weapons, I think he can do something not you know but at least in those easy first half of the season you know keep you in games and and buoy your record but uh my big fear is that offensive line the depth on it if you get injuries yeah that oh, that's things things can go south pretty quickly because right now you're looking at Braxton Jones was already held out and they said it was preventative because they don't want it anybody to get hurt in mini camp to that. So they're not available in training camp. So they said it's hundred percent precautionary, but Braxton Jones has already been out. Tevin Jenkins has never played 17 games. Um, 
I don't know uh, between Shelton and uh, and Bates. I don't know what your center play is going to look like. Is it going to be better than yeah, last year? I hope I so. I, yeah, I, I I hope it's at least marginally. It. I mean, on paper, it should be not great, but significantly better than it was because you had some of the worst over the last several years, you had some of the worst center play. So on paper, it should be significantly better, even if it's not great. Um, but I, you never know. Nate Davis is, he's already missed some of the, the training camp or the mini camp. And, you know, he didn't have a great season last year and it was a, you know, I, I understand what happened, but you know, he, he missed a lot of training camp and wasn't ready to start the season and got injured and didn't play spectacularly. Um, so that leaves Darnell Wright. You know, is he going to hit a sophomore slump? I don't. I don't think so. I'm the most confident about him, but I, I just that's that's my big concern. And I know you did add some backup help, but. I, I don't love it. I don't. Love yeah. See, the, the depth. He, I, I, th- my whole thing is my big concern with the Bears is if you have to rely on winning the trench battle, I don't have a whole lot of confidence in that. No, definitely not. I mean, I think this offensive line, if it's healthy, so Braxton Jones plays, takes that big next step forward, and. Darnell Wright already played really well last year, especially for, he was by far and away the best rookie offensive lineman. And he was pretty darn good, even just as a lineman in general. If Tevin Jenkins, when he's healthy, he's one of the, he's, he's a, one of the better guards really in the league. Nate Davis is, has shown that he can play at a very high level. And so like, if you look, some of the, the guard combo rankings have the bears have like a top five guard combination ranking if those guys are healthy and play their best and so even if you get like mediocre play at center and everybody else is healthy this line should you can can win with that this line should be plenty good enough to win to take you to the playoffs i've seen way worse offensive lines to go to the playoffs so it's just that the injury concerns uh, you know, especially after Braxton got hurt last year, I just, there's, there's just not a lot of margin for error. No, there's not. And you know, you're going to be dealing with things. And I, I'm a big Tevin Jenkins guy, but I don't think you can realistically slate him in for 17 games. I don't think so either. And, you know, I know that it's been public that he went, he and his, his agent went to the team asking about a contract extension. And they said, it's not, on the table at this point, I, I would, I mean, I wouldn't either. And I love, I'm probably one of the biggest Tevin Jenkins stands there is, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be ready to sign him because he's going to cost you a lot of money. I would not be ready to sign him either. I, he's got to prove himself in this last year is, is he coming in? You know, I know early on there was some issues with his attitude and his motivation. And then, but you found a position for him after bouncing him from left tackle to right tackle to guard that you finally found a spot for him where he's excelling, but it's keeping him healthy. And I heard him talk during the off season that he's invested a lot of time and money and effort into improving his body and eating better and, uh, you know, hiring experts to help him with, you know, the, the keeping his body healthy with flexibility and, you know, there's experts in soft, soft tissue, uh, you know, pliability. Um, and so he's gone to those experts and spent that money and time to, to try to be better. I just hope it works out because I would, I would love if they could pay him and he could be a bear for 10 years. It just, you gotta, you gotta, you got to be available. If you only get eight, nine games, I don't think you can justify giving him the money because the reality is linemen are expensive. Yeah. So if you're going to be dropping a lot of your cap space on a lineman, 
you better be paying for something that's pretty guaranteed. Yeah, I, I'm hoping I'm hoping the conversation was, hey, we would love to. You just got to show us. You got to give us 17 games this year. Yes. And and so he knows that, hey, this team wants me. They just got to make sure I'm I'm available to earn that money. For sure. Um, but yeah, so I'm just excited. I can't wait. Uh, my wife and I are, are going to go to training camp. So I think, uh, tickets, tickets go up on July 1st. Uh, they're free, but they are, uh, you need a ticket to go. Cause it's not like the old bourbon day day where you just showed up. Right. Um, right. Yep. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, we're looking to go, so it should be a blast. And, uh, I learned my lesson from the first time I ever went. Wear sunscreen, bring a hat, yeah. charge your charge your devices, <laughs> and bring water. <laughs> All advisable things. Uh, All advisable things. I, I'm sure I'm going to be trying to get to the uh, family day at Soldier Field. I've been doing that every year for years. So uh, yeah, the last few years it. it's fun. The last few years there's it's just been there's like it's some reason or another I couldn't go. But we'll try to go to a training. Well, they camp change and... in the middle of the week, you know, like during the morning. So, like, I'll always take the day off work to go. But I remember a few years back, it used to be at night. It was easier for families to go to. Yeah, it was on Sunday, for, I think, for a bit, and then it was we uh on a nighttime. Yeah, now it's a um, it's just a dumb time, it's like, like a Wednesday or a th- like a Tuesday or a Wednesday at like eleven. Yeah, let's see. Do they have the date for it yet the other problem the other problem with that now is like um it's usually when kids are just getting ready to go back to school so the free time isn't always there for a family even during the day but Uh, yeah let's let's see when it is this year yeah it does not look like it's the uh the family fest page on the bears website is still from last year you know i remember i i feel like i haven't really seen the dates for family fest until closer when it actually happens so yeah uh, this see. year would be the first year i would i wouldn't be mad if it was a weekday during the week because i start a new job tomorrow and oh my, exciting my office is it's it's the same company, it's just a different job. So, but it's gotcha. uh, my office is downtown, so it's a, uh, it's like right at Clark, like right near Clark and Lake. So, um, much tune, nice, much much easier to get to Soldier Field than from my old office in Buffalo Grove. Yeah. <laughs> hey, funny, I'm in Buffalo Grove yesterday. I was walking the Buffalo Trails. Okay, yeah, my office is literally at the corner. Well, sorry, my last day there was Thursday, but my office was literally at the corner of Milwaukee and uh, uh, Lake Hook Road. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, the, the Buffalo Trails I was on. That's right off Lake Hook Road. I literally take the highway and get right off Lake Road. And then I think that's like the border of Arlington Heights and Buffalo Grove. And then you just take a left and the, the trails are right there. Yeah, so I, uh, I, well, I, I take the to walk the trail a little bit for like, you know, the middle of the day to get out and get a little exercise. But lately, man, those, those uh, cicadas, you're like, I can't, I can't oh. walk this trail. They are everywhere. They dive bomb you. They're so bad. And they're so loud. I mean, it's, it, you literally look in the trees and they're swarm. It, it looks like the Egyptian plagues from the old Testament with the locusts. Yes. Yeah, it, like it's vile. Like I was walking, and one just like kamikaze me, like whack right in the side of my head. And I turned, and like another yep. one hit me, in the, and they're just flying into me. And I'm like, "All right, I'm out. I can't. I yeah, can't do this. they're 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 bad. And um, the other thing thing that you have to allow those trails to is, um, have you seen those like red winged crows? Those those black birds with like the orangish red wings on them. Yes. You got to be careful with those because if they're building nests, they can get aggressive. On, on the other end, you have to be careful. There's little tiny turtles and you gotta, cannot step on them. The turtles. Yeah, like I saw one and it's about the size of like, like maybe a little bit bigger than a quarter. 
And I was like, little turtle, little turtle. And I had to help him move him over so he didn't, uh, he wasn't in the path of bicycles. If no one will save the wheat turtles, who will? <laughs> uh, was there anything else you wanted to talk about? No, I think I've said my piece. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Bill Swirsky Sports Talk Chicago. I want to thank everybody so much for listening. Please hit subscribe, however you listen to podcasts, whether it's iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Google Play, Spotify, etc. Share this podcast with your friends. That would grow the show. Follow us on social media at Swirsky Sports, Facebook.com slash Swirsky Sports, Swirsky Sports.com, uh, or uh, Shy Fan Pat 2 for Alex on Twitter slash X or Alexander J. Cre- jpatcreative.com for all the cool stuff that Alex does. And again, thank you guys so much for listening. Until next time, bear down. Come win! What a lucky break! The good Lord wants the Cubs to win! We thank Dick and God for all they have provided. Uh, 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 Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! Oh, I don't want her. You can have her. She's a Packer fan. She can't fit in my van. And she looks like... Remember, New Yorkers, smoking crack is not legal on the plains. Bears, 31 to negative 7. The Bears. Oh, when the Bears go bearing.